The whole ridge is for fighting, and both sides know it well. Wayak relaxes, waiting for his comrades and the enemy to signal their readiness by drawing close enough to fire. Only Mike Mo, who acts as leader, is especially concerned. The enemy badly wants the death that will restore the balance which they lost almost three weeks before. With so many men firing such a quantity of arrows, there is always a chance that one of the many wounds they are certain to inflict will bring about the death they want so much. Finally, Mike Mo's urgings take effect and his men withdraw. It is customary that both sides, after fighting hard for a period of time, withdraw to nurse wounds, smoke cigarettes, and review the course of events. The arrows are not poisoned, but they are barbed and notched so as to break off on impact. One young warrior, pained but also pleased by his wound, was lucky that an older man has enough to hold as he works the arrow free. Wayak was worried that so many arrows had found their mark, but most of the others were merely stung into more aggressive action. The enemy fell back, thinking that Wayak's group had been secretly reinforced. Having retreated, there was nowhere for them to go except off the ridge and onto some flat land just in front of their little mountain. There, almost at their own frontier, they turned and resumed fighting. At the end of the ridge, the pursuers caught their breath. Close by the gardens, where their warrior had been killed during a raid only three weeks before, the enemy reorganized, knowing there was still time for fighting. As long as there is enough light to see arrows in flight, and barring sudden rain, or what is much rarer, sudden death, a formal battle continues throughout the day.
Wayak rests and lets the younger men exert themselves on the skirmish line. In this, its new phase, the battle is supervised by Nilik, who sends a fresh group to back up the skirmishers. Past water-worn patches of white sand, a wounded enemy is carried home on the shoulders of his friends. Nilik, not yet convinced the enemy was content to end the fighting, keeps a watchful eye, as do two young warriors who, a moment before, sought in vain to kill each other. Laka did hear that Tuesi, a man from Wuburainma, was badly wounded, and she wondered how he was. The arrow had ended beneath the collarbone, and its tip broke off beneath the skin. Tekman, because he lives with Tuesi in Wuburainma, and because he is famous as a surgeon, knew that the only way to get the arrow out was to grip it with his teeth. Had it been barbed, as most arrows are, Tuesi would have had a far more difficult time and much less chance of living. At the end of the ridge, the others hurl abusive jokes instead of spears. The enemy, for now, is forced to listen. <laughs> <laughs> to patch the wound, some moistened leaves are bound in place with bits of long grass. To revive his attire, Ken, literally to call back his seeds of singing from their flight to his backbone, 
A friend applies a wand of grass and murmurs magic words. <laughs> Tekman makes the last of four punctures in the belly's wall to let out the blood turned dark by the enemy's arrow. The time to leave has come. For most, the walk ahead will take an hour, and no one wants to risk a meeting with a ghost. Tuasi will not have to walk, but he must be covered to protect him from the gaze of ghosts, which wounded men are careful to avoid. Tuasi starts home, his weapons and his life in the hands of men from his own village. <laughs> 